All right, let's turn to, oh, while we're doing that, bye, Cassie and Grace. Bye. I didn't get to see you guys. Bye, sweet girl. <laughs> turn to, ah, oh, there it went. John chapter 8. <clears throat> and, um, you know, Jesus, the thing about Jesus as a man is that he stood for God and he stood for the truth. And, and I'm saying that because he didn't stand for himself. Okay? Um, we hear, you know, anybody can say, Jesus stood up, he stood for God, or he stood for the Father, or he stood for the truth. But folks... That's not the whole picture. He stood for God and he stood for the truth and not for himself. Okay? Amen. And uh, he, he walked this earth to glorify the Father. And, and we'll see this over and over throughout this course. But in, in different situations, he didn't seek for personal advantage in those situations, which most men do. If you're not of this new man, then we're, we're feeling our way through every situation trying to find the advantage for us. And um, this, this spirit is not asking to be raised or uh, exalted or sustained. It's just happy to exalt the Father and to not seek for official glory <clears throat> of its own. Um, you know, Jesus said something like it. Um, the disciples said, uh, "Are you hungry? And we need to get something." He says, "No, I have something to eat that you don't know of." He's living off of something that other people, even disciples, don't even know of. You know, say, "Well, how do you explain something that people don't know of?" Well, you don't. The Holy Spirit does, but you must be faithful to the word of God and to the truth and and more importantly in this situation we must be faithful to him not just what he did because we are seeing him in the true glory in which God exalted him and not the glory that most people would exalt someone over <clears throat> so it was his meat it was his food to do what pleased the father um, so in um, John chapter 8 and verse 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? Now this, is, this happens quite a bit. Or not, not a whole lot, but I mean it happens quite a bit where the people are just saying. In fact, there is one place where they say, Look, just tell us. Just tell us plainly. And, and he, then he says something, but he doesn't, you know. He didn't say, I'm the Messiah. Okay, I'm the Messiah. Okay, I'm the Son of God. I'm it. He frustrates the fool out of them because he won't exalt himself. Okay? So they say, who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. They go, well, we weren't there the first day you started your ministry. Maybe he's not talking about that beginning. Um... And then he says, I have many things to say unto you and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. Look at this. He, they're going, who are you? And he says, well, look, I got a lot of things I need to tell you, but I'm telling you, he that sent me is true. See, he's, he's not wasting time on exalting himself. He immediately goes to the, the Father. He says, he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard from him. So if you're getting anything from what I'm saying, it's what I got from him. Again, veiling, putting a veil on the Holy of Holies, and only those who are intrigued enough to want to press through will find out the true Jesus. Will find out the true Jesus. And that takes revelation or unveiling. The word revelation means unveiling, renting the veil. And so Jesus says, or he says, uh, or verse 27, they understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. They, they are saying, who are you? And so he starts talking, but he's not exalting himself, and he's speaking to the Father, and they don't get it. Why? 
Because all people speak of themselves. All people promote themselves. All mankind except this new kind of man, this new creation, are in it for what they can get out of it. All right? And so they're not going to understand it. And then verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please the Father. And you can read that several different ways, and I think both ways are good. One is to say, no matter what he does, he always does what pleases the Father. And the other one is, is that what he is, uh, is that his intention, it, it's not just, it doesn't matter what I do, I please the Father, but that his intention and his motive and his angle you know, somebody says, well, everybody has an angle that they're working. Jesus' angle that he's working is to please the Father. He's trying to be the ideal man. He's trying not to be the Son of God in glory. He's trying to live as an example because when he walked this earth, listen to this, there's a difference between Jesus being the example of life and the life in incarnation he's the example of what we should live in the resurrection he is the life in all the believers does that make sense or you can say you can say in the incarnation he's the only one that and and he's the one that is the perfect example but in the resurrection or the new creation, he lives that. He's no longer an example. He's living it in us. Okay, I guess I better add that. Amen. He lives that in us. Okay, he is the life. He's not giving us an example for our lives in the in the new creation. He is the life. Jesus said, "I am the resurrection and I'm the life." Okay, so. Um, as he walks, um, he is the perfect representation of what man was always meant to be. <clears throat> so uh, we'll read verse 29 again so we can go into the next verse. And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. Folks, that would be the high point for most evangelists. You're telling them the truth. You're telling them this stuff. And all of a sudden, many believe. Woohoo! I mean, right at this point now, once that verse says Jesus should be going, whoopee, and, you know, doing up cheers and all this kind of stuff, I finally got many that believe on me. But I want you to know that Jesus is trying to make something more out of us than believers. Because if he's just trying to make believers find, finally get many that believe on him, that's, that would be called progress. But Jesus steps in and he says right after many believe, then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him. What's he going to say? What's he going to say to those finally, he finally gets some that believe on him? What words are going to come out of his mouth? Oh, blessed are you, for you have stepped out of the realm of unbelief and into the realm of believers, and, and you shall follow me into glory. Well, that doesn't really sound like Jesus. That sounds like a televangelist. Can I get an oh me? I mean, that's what it is. Here's what Jesus said. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. All right. So Jesus is not just interested in making us into believers because he's got believers. And he immediately says to believers, there's more on the road to progress. I don't want you to just believe things about me. I want you to know. And in knowing, those very realities will be what sets you free. Or makes you free because that's actually the word makes you something that in believing you believe things about me 
but in knowing you are made into something and that something frees you. Okay, now our minds go to all of the doctrines that we think if we know those, they will make us free. Jesus isn't talking about doctrines here. He's just told you that they believed on him, on what he's been saying, and Jesus is saying, the things that I've been telling you and the, and the way that I've been presenting myself, this you must continue in the word until it's made you free. What has he been talking about? Well, we've just been reading it. He won't glorify himself. He stands for God and not himself. He will not glorify himself. He uses whatever uh, he can through his uh, glory of nature to glorify the Father. Okay? And when somebody grasps miracles or something to glorify him, he immediately begins to, to take the attention away from that. We'll see that more as we go. But he, he will not capitalize. He will not capitalize on manifestations of the Father to glorify himself. Because these are the works of the Father, and he's saying it. I don't do them. I don't know, you know. I mean, you know, there, you, you eventually get to a place where you can actually say, it's not I but Christ, and it not be blasphemy. Amen. You can actually get to that place where you're not lying, <laughs> you know. But it's, uh, somebody asked me recently, they said, how can people that have hidden lives and all this filth and junk in their life, but nobody knows about it, how can they turn and condemn somebody when theirs comes to the surface? How can they be so vehement in it? Like, oh, you, you're doing wrong. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Where somebody else has got all sorts of junk, but nobody knows about it. But when somebody else is exposed, they just attack it. Well, they have a belief system that only what comes out is really actually condemnable. And they can't, they, 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 that frees them from looking in and saying, you know what, I'm no, I'm no better than them. We're all needing Jesus. Does anybody agree with that? We all need Jesus. Folks, the only, the only thing that I've got going for me is Jesus. I mean, I'm down in Mexico and on the border and doing different things, and, and I'm telling you with absolute truth, Jesus was magnificent. Amen. But I sure wasn't. I wasn't. I am, I, I, you know, it's just like you just go, you know, glory to you. And somebody tries to lift you up. It's not humility to go, well, that wasn't me. Because it wasn't me. That's not humility. I mean, does that make sense? That's not humility. We go, oh, you're so humble. No, I'm not humble. It wasn't me. It's the Lord. He's the only thing I got. The only thing in all my life that's been worth anything is this oneness, is this vine branch relationship that I've got where he's able to come out and so you know within your being that you're every bit as bad as anybody else if it's not for the Lord. And you start judging people, all the Lord's got to do is just sort of put a, a tourniquet on your little branch for a week or a month or you know, just cut the juice off and you go, you know, and then everybody sees that you're just as flaky as everybody else. Why don't you just admit that up front? <laughs> just admit we're all desperately in need of Jesus and thank God, you know, he's going to be the one on the throne that we're all going, glory to you, glory to you. And that's how it begins. Then he takes us all into New Jerusalem and makes us bride. And then he flows out of us and the whole time, we're, we're singing glory to you, glory to you. But it's, uh, you know, I'm sure Kelly's class, I, I don't know where she's at 
in her class, but when you get in the prophets, boy, these prophets come down hard because they know the futility of every one of you, even though we're the chosen of God. You're futile and you're just as rotten to the core as anybody else. And they spend a good portion of their letters trying to drill that in people until they see it, you know, and word, you know, like Isaiah, he, it's a message that he has until Isaiah 6, and I'm sorry if I'm preaching, but, but it's a message, you know, doesn't he? Woe unto you who drink wine. Woe unto you that do this. Woe unto you. Woe. And then he sees the Lord and goes, woe unto me. <laughs> And then he realizes, because there was a, if you read it, there's an attitude behind all the woes until you get to chapter 6. And that attitude is, you're wrong, you're messed up, you shouldn't be doing this. And after Isaiah 6, it's like, woe is me, we're all undone. He didn't say, I'm a man of unclean lips. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips and dwell among a people. We're all undone and unclean. Well, you say, well, you know, I've never done as bad as that person. Oh, man. God put you in half the chance to do that, and you'll see that you are filthy. I was talking to a, a, a Mexican man down there and trying to minister to him over some issues, and, and he said that, that he'd gotten saved through this incident. He was yelling at his wife and his kids and knocking stuff around and he was an alcoholic to that point and all of a sudden he started throwing up and he had this t-shirt on and he threw up all over himself and and he's standing there and he looks up and he's standing in front of this mirror and he sees what he looks like to them and how he's been ranting and raving what he looks like and he just goes oh my god this is me i need jesus and that's how he got saved <laughs> which is pretty cool you know and uh, and so now here it is, because he was an older man now, and he's come to me over some issues and some problems that he'd got. And I said, what'd you do with that shirt when you stood there in front of that mirror? He said, I threw that thing away. I said, it's time to throw this one away too. <laughs> we're the same unless it's the Lord. No, I didn't say we're the same without the Lord. I said, we're the same unless it's the Lord in each and every one of us. And don't get high and mighty looking down on people or thinking you're better because God will show you. It's just better to, you know, what it, my words is make your words soft and tender for you may have to eat them someday. You know, <laughs> you know. Well, people want, uh, people want you to think that they go through life in perfection. Ha! Ah! They don't. They don't. Jesus is the only hope of every human being on this earth. And the hope of Jesus is not salvation. The hope of Jesus is that we, in Jesus is that we know the truth. And the truth that he lives by gets in us and makes us something. It makes us free from what we were before. And then we begin to live to glorify only the Father and not to take advantage of situations so that we can glorify ourselves. Or, or, or here's what I mean by that. Bring about official glory for us in the earth. You'll be content with people recognizing this self-giving Christ in you. What will they do when they recognize it? Well, they will abuse you. They will take advantage of you. Jesus said that. Jesus, he said, men shall take advantage of you. They shall treat you wrong. They shall, uh, um, what is it? Um, be, uh, when, you know, da-da-da, when people uh, cast your name out as evil and persecute you. And there was another one like, uh, despitefully use you. Despitefully. Okay. Well, forget the despitefully. How about this? They use you. They use not just the Lord that you have in you, but they use the willingness 
to give when they don't deserve it, to give unto them, to minister to them when they know they don't deserve it. And yet they'll use it, and then they'll go away, and they'll forget about you, and, you know. Um, the, the example I always think of when I mention that is, you know, Joseph, when he was brought down into Egypt, you know, I mean, you know, Joseph was, before he was brought down into Egypt, he was rejected by his brothers. Does that hurt? Yes. Well, then they beat him up. Does that hurt? Yeah. Well, then they threw him in a pit. Does that hurt? Yeah. Then they sold him to Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt and made money off of it. Does that hurt? You know, most of us haven't gone that far. <laughs> so he goes down. God blesses him. He gets put in this home and everything. The wife starts coming on to him. He rejects it. So she lies to it, lies about it and says all this stuff happened. Husband sees that he's thrown into prison. Okay? Sees that he's thrown into prison. I did them nothing but good. I I lived for the Lord and God blessed them. God did bless them, didn't he? God only blessed them, it says, because of Joseph. It says that. <laughs> so they threw their blessing away. Wait, let me finish my story and then I'll get you. Uh, <clears throat> so then, he's thrown into prison. He's thrown into a dungeon. He's thrown in the depth of a dungeon. And some... You know, the baker and the da-da-da-da, they have a dream and whatever, and so he interprets the dream, and he tells the guy, now, you're getting out of here. I'm, I've seen from the Lord, so be sure and make sure I get official glory when you get out of here and go tell the king I was a really good guy. What happens? He forgets, and God keeps him in there for two more years or something. You know, because you got to get all that stuff out. You do. You know, it's like, okay, I'm sorry, my God, every time I do this, it sets me back another two years or another five years. I need to get this right. Anybody ever thought that? <laughs> I need to get this right. Lord, help me. So finally he goes, you know, I can just see him. He looks like a mummy in the corner. I'm not saying anything. I'm not going to do anything. I'll bless you. Forget it. Don't even say anything. You know, I mean, I can see this going on, you know. He's just like, because if I open my mouth or stretch forth my hand, it's going to be in, for selfishness or it's going to be to save myself, and I've got to stop doing this. So he stopped doing it. <laughs> He's raised up second most to Pharaoh. I mean, not just, you know, somebody spoke highly of you. We're going to let you out and give you a nice paying job second under Pharaoh, you know, <clears throat> official glory. Where do you think that official glory came from? It came strictly from the fact that he became satisfied with the glory of nature. Does that make sense to anybody? When he, when he quit clawing after official glory, because he could, folks, Official glory is what he was flaunting in the face of his brothers that caused this whole thing. Well, I'm going to be big and I'm going to be great and don't worry, you're all going to come and bow down to me. You know, and just all, you know, all of that. And so let's just say that that vision he saw when he was young puffed him up and filled him with all kinds of thoughts of official glory. Well, he wasn't the man God wanted. You get it? He's not the man God wants. So God takes him through all that job. And you say, poor Joseph, he had it worse than his brothers. Well, I don't know, man. I, I think being dealt with and knowing you're still in the hand of God, even if he's, he's you know, bringing junk on your head, is better than having leanness in your soul. That's my opinion. In fact, that's really my opinion. 
I would rather know that I am in the dealing of God, the hand of God, and as, even if I'm going down into the prison or thrown in a pit, that that's the will of God for a greater purpose, and I'm with him in it. I'd rather have that than to wander aimlessly in the wilderness until I drop. And I fully believe that. I'm sorry, I, I'm just like the baker. I forgot you had your hand up a while ago. <laughs> now, <laughs> Scott, take your official glory. <laughs> Maybe I won't. <laughs> no, I, I just, you know, I was just thinking about how, you know, the, the lamb is the one that's on the throne, and, and that was the only way that God could bring Joseph to that place, was to bring him to the point where, where he was lamb. And that, that was it. And not only that, but to be satisfied with that kind of glory. Because remember now, in uh, Potiphar's home and, and in dealing with the baker and the, what was it, the butcher and the Indian chief? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed are the cheese makers. And, uh, that, that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that these, that all of those were situations where he was using the blessing of God, now this is important, or the, the giftings of God to get further, even if, it, even if it was unjust, even if it was all wrong and unjust, it's all that unjustness is doing one thing. It's simply bringing out his wrong motives. And here's the thing, God showed him the vision about everyone bound down. So he doesn't even think it's wrong motives. He thinks it's the vision of God. And he's trying to help God get him out of the lowest place to the highest place. And every time he does something to help, he goes lower. You know? Brothers reject you. Brothers beat you up. Throw you in a pit. Sell you, sell you to Ishmaelites. Go down to Egypt where God had brought you out. Come on. I mean, this all works on a Jew. You know, <laughs> you know, God brought me out here, and I'm coming back in slavery. And they're not, and they're the bad guys. This is real stuff. This is real stuff. Well, if we don't know the dealing of God, if we don't know what this whole thing's about, we're going to be confused every step of the way. If we know what it's about, and we will learn, he will keep if you'll stay with him, if you how about this? If you'll continue in his word, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You know? And that's what Jesus said, and that's where he was going with this. And so finally he gets it, and finally he shuts up, and finally he quits trying to wind-dangle himself out. As soon as he does, God does the impossible. Well, it's not the impossible. It's the automatic of glory of nature. He'll, he will highly exalt you and get... But at, by the time that happens, you won't care anymore. No, you won't. I'm telling you the truth. You won't care anymore because you've been made free or you've been made lamb or you've been made one with him. You've been made after his likeness and in his image and in his nature. And all you want to do is continue to give. And isn't that really what he did? God gave him the key to the storehouses and said, you disseminate it. God, Pharaoh, and God through Pharaoh. And all he did was pour out as people came from all over the world and he gave and he blessed and he poured out. He was still, it was still the glory of nature working in him, not official glory. Outward acknowledgement. Exaltation on any level. Yes. That's good. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good example, a good statement. He gave to others in the lean time because it was famine, and everybody was coming to who? Him, okay? His own brothers came to him. Did they say, oh, we're sorry, we didn't know, you know, we exalt you and all this kind of stuff? He, he continued to veil it for a long time. 
And in fact, I tell you what, what he did to his brothers was exactly what God did to him. The old silver cup. It's the old silver cup trick. Aha. Beware, folks, of the silver cup trick. Because it's basically what the vision was, a silver cup, you know, to him, and then it gets buried in your sack, and then, you, you know, all this stuff starts happening. And so, you know, so Joseph doesn't unveil himself in his official glory. He keeps it hidden. And it's personal to him. And he has to get up and go out of the room and cry over the whole thing because what? They don't know him. And they're even talking about what they did to Joseph. And he can hear it. And he's Joseph. You know. And so uh, he's, he sets the stage. And he says to his man, put this silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And this is after several different things going on. So he puts the silver cup in there. And so then the Egyptian army goes out and says, after they leave, and says, hey, you guys, you know, uh, the, the king's silver cup is missing. Joseph's silver cup, or not Joseph, because he wasn't called Joseph. Zaphnath Paneah, the man to whom God reveals himself. Secrets, his secrets. You know, God, that's what they called him. <laughs> they, that's some, you know, he's in prison and they're not seeing official glory. But they're calling him Zaphnath Paneah. This is the one to whom God reveals his secrets. So they go out there and they say, we've got Zaphnath Paneah's cup. No, no, we are true men. As long as you think that, as long as you think you're a true man, as long as you think you, there's still something redeemable about you and good about you, you are on the road to hell. <laughs> And I'm not talking about the location. I'm talking about life's junk that it throws at you. So they start going through all this stuff, and then he drags them back, and they're going, we didn't, we didn't know. I mean, we, it's, our, it's our youngest brother, and we didn't know. And, you know, and so then they say, we're going to keep so-and-so, and then he sends them away, and, and uh, one of them's in prison, and, and they say, now, to... Convince me you have to bring back Benjamin. I, I, I might be getting the story a little off here, but I want to see him face to face. And so they're not going to do it, and they leave their other brother in prison. <laughs> Why? Because they're selfish. They're not self-giving. They don't care what happens to him. They're only thinking about what happens to us. Until finally... What does he say? We're going to throw Benjamin in prison or something? And Judah says, no, no. Somebody steps up with the spirit, the right spirit, and says, I will go into prison for him. Don't put him into prison. You're going to kill our father's heart because Benjamin and Joseph, the son that's already died, they were bound together in the heart of our father Anybody getting this? We got a father, our heavenly father, and they're bound, and he's bound into his heart because Joseph has died. And they're crying and going, We should never have done this to Joseph. Now they're now they're breaking. Now they're not blaming Joseph or anything else. Now they're coming to an end of themselves and they're all going, now all this has happened because we would not go the way of the Lord and the right spirit and everything. But Judah steps up to the plate. And he says, I see what's needed here. I'll, I will stay here. I will go into prison. I'll be the one that will self-give. I will lay down my life. That busts the whole thing wide open. The release of that spirit. <laughs> Veils up. Highly exalted, official glory. Everything is out in the open now. 
Why, why don't God bless my ministry? I'm sincere. Why didn't God open doors? Why didn't this is the average Christian who's trying to do something for God and sincere but doesn't understand the right spirit. And so they're just going, they're just confused. Man, I'm doing the best I can and God won't bless me. I don't know what his problem is. Well, I got news for you. He doesn't have a problem. You do. You know? And he's waiting for a specific thing. He's waiting for the glory of nature. And when he gets it, all of what he planned and had in mind explodes forth. That's what I wanted all the time. What was the class that, that I shared that on? Uh, Judah means praise. Was that what it was? The Joseph series, which I shared 24 or something, a bunch of classes on that one. Anyway, so what I just shared here was in 24 classes. And, but, um, well, let me just read a little bit here because I've done an awful lot of talking. Uh, Jesus stood for God in truth and not for himself. He did not seek the personal advantage of the situation. He asked not to be raised or sustained by others. Uh, but contrary to that, we honor or dishonor people as to how they best affect us. We judge them as to how they treat us. Our interest in them is based on what effect they can better influence and improve our lives or status. The people connect the possession of power or prosperity with the means for serving their own interests and advantage. In other words, um, I, I, you know, this could be anybody, but at this time period that I'm reading this and addressing this, who got voted in as president? Okay, don't say his name so that we don't all get attacked. But somebody got voted in as president. Did they vote him in primarily because of the stand that he has on issues or because of the benefit they thought that he would bring to their personal lives and, and statuses to how they live? And you, you, know, you answer that for yourself. But what if it was really had nothing to do with politics or or a moral stand or any of that, none of that ever came up. It's just that I will do this and the economy will better, be better. I will do this and you won't have as many taxes. I will do this and, and so everybody's going, me, 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 me. Yeah, he's our man. He's the perfect one for me. <laughs> okay, I'm, so I'm just trying to get you to see. I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody down and I'm not trying to be political, but I'm just trying to show you in fact, I'm not even talking about the person. The reaction of the people is what he wouldn't even be in office if, if people had a, a platform. <laughs> but there wasn't even a platform. It was just simply everything was said, this will improve your life and this will do this and that. Okay. Well, that's not necessarily that he's wrong, but it is certainly necessary that we, uh, necessarily a fact that we are wrong if that's our motivation. In other words, how did, how did I read it? Um, we connect the possession of power or prosperity or position with the means for serving our own interests and advantage. But Jesus is not doing it so he can get back homage or position from you. When he's walking the earth, he's not doing that at all. He's discouraging a lot of that. Don't tell anybody. You know, don't go spread this around. You know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Completely opposite of what evangelists do today or ministers. You know, if somebody gets healed in a miraculous way in a local church, they want to spread it everywhere. Look, God's with us. Come here. Jesus would heal somebody and say, now don't go tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Why, Jesus? Well, you'll get more glory. I'll get more official glory. Am I right or wrong? I'll get more official glory. All right. So um, he does it to serve the needs of man and not just their interests. 
to serve the needs of men and not just their interests or their advantage. <clears throat> this is going to be hard to say just by verbalizing. I believe that Jesus primarily moves to minister to people's needs, not their advantage. Tell me, what does, that, what does that mean? What does that say? Well, it says that when our motivation is to get advantage over somebody or get position or move up or to be seen or glorified with official glory, he's not interested in helping us. I mean, think about that. But when we're just in need, when we're just the poor, this poor man cried unto the Lord and he heard my cry. When we're nothing but just needy to him, he comes and he sees that we're, we're, there's no, it's not an evil motivation going on. We're desperate. And he's there. You know. Problem is, not too many people get desperate. <laughs> how, you know, how much does it take to get the average person to a place where he's desperate for God? Oh, my God. You know. It takes a lot. <clears throat> All right. Any official, let's see, any official glory they would give him would be based on one who has the power to improve my situation. Did you hear what I said? They will give official glory if they know that you're going to use that power and position and glory to improve my situation. Okay. What they perceived from Jesus was that he wasn't going to use his stuff to just help the flesh. And so they weren't willing to give him official glory. <clears throat> uh, and there's more to that sentence, so let me read it again. Any official glory they would give him would be based on, this is in parentheses, one who has the power to improve my situation, unquote, and not on any true worthiness of the person. They will exalt someone if that person will help further and improve their situation. But if they're not, they're not going to do that, and they will do that without any regard of the worthiness of the person to be in that position or to have official glory. Well, that ought to just scare the fool out of us, you know? That ought to just scare the fool out of us. So here, here we go. We scrape and bow before those with whom we hope to gain some advantage, caring not what their moral qualities are. Shall I read it again? We scrape and bow before those with whom we hope to gain some advantage, caring not what their moral qualities are. If honoring them and, oh, you Da, 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 causes them to give us some advantage and improve our situation. Oh, well, and it doesn't even matter what if they're just corrupt on the inside. Folks, there are corrupt people. You know, uh, take, for example, some of the unions. Many of the unions, not all of them, but some, some of the unions, particularly years and years ago, were corrupt with mobsters filled in all the offices and stuff like that. But the people put them there. They didn't just put themselves there. The people put them there because these guys said, I'll make sure your wages are high and you'll get your rights and we'll take care of you. And they said, you're our man. He said, I'm Jimmy Offa. I'll cut heads off and kill people, but I'll get you some more money. I might have to cut your head off if you get in my way, but we won't mention that right now. So it's like, um, okay. We want you. We want Hoffa. Well, now you got half a Hoffa. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of morals. <laughs> and, you know, and I'm going to end with this because we're almost time. But, but if you consider our society, you know, some of you haven't been around that long, but our society has totally changed from one that used to honor people of moral character and whatever, 
and it's moved to people that don't, you don't even have to consider their moral character if they're a good athlete, meaning if they have good gifts and whatever, or they're, they're an actor that everybody goes, oh, you know. You, all an actor has to do is act a part that, of a person with good character. And we see the movie and we go, oh, I just love so-and-so. <laughs> you know, and then it comes out later that, you know, and you go, Oh my God, what happened? You know, oops, he slipped. <laughs> well, what if he didn't slip? What if he was always that way and you watched a movie? You fell in love with a movie. You know, and, and that does happen in this country. And that, that is a regular thing. Um, you know, this, I'll, I could be killed for this one. But we traded Tom Landry for Jerry Jones. Now, I don't know if you know who Tom Landry was, but he was an incredible coach, not because he was just a good coach, because he was an incredible coach, but because uh, I remember Bob Lilly saying, he said, I love Tom Landry when he would get to the chalkboard and he'd start teaching us about football. And he would get through and we'd go, he, he was teaching us about life and how to treat one another and stuff. <laughs> he said that, you know, and Bob Lilly's an upstanding, you know, guy. And... Roger Staubach, you know, all this kind of stuff. We traded that in for Jerry Jones. <laughs> Whew. Oh, my God. You know, and you say, well, he brought us three Super Bowls. <laughs> well, you know, I'd rather have Tom Landry. He only brought us two. <laughs> you know, but I'd rather, I miss Tom Landry. And I miss looking at a team that I was proud of on, from the inside out, you know. And that I felt like there's more to this than football. I don't want to just be a, a fan. I want, I, you know, I like to have everything that I really appreciate and respect have something of the Lord somehow behind it. But, okay, I got off. So, um, next, next uh, class when we come back together, and please help me think of a title for that one because I've sort of wandered now. But the next class, I want to get more into this thing of how, uh, of, of Jesus, how he didn't demand official glory and how when we get in situations like he was in, we would demand and expect official glory. We would, or we'd be upset if we didn't get it. And I want to show you clearly that Jesus didn't, and then I want you to come to the conclusion that that's the kind of life he wants to live in us, where we don't have to have all of that. The Father knows, and the Father's pleased, and that should be a good enough for us. All right. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that you didn't just give him to save our corrupt little rears. You gave him to be able to meld in and us with him so that he, his life becomes ours and his nature becomes ours and you are glorified by the Son in us. Father, help us, help us to quit being so prideful and ambitious and to be uh, content, content in whatever state we find ourselves. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.